Here's what's coming up on your horizon. Well, for a relatively small state, when it comes to population, Oklahoma produces quite a lot. From energy to agriculture and manufacturing, we extract, grow, and make any number of things, all heading outside our state's borders. Today, our focus is on the wheels of commerce, transportation, and see how trucking has made Oklahoma the crossroads of the nation. If trucking stops, Oklahoma stops, America stops. It's that vital. We look at the work underway to ensure Oklahoma has the workforce to keep those big wheels rolling. Distance in between vehicles, the tracking and trailing, the braking system, maneuvering, it's all of this way different than backing up a horse trailer. In a partnership with Oklahoma Watch, we examine mass transit in the state. Really, I think, you know, the regional cooperation is just a, a very important step because that's how this advances. And then we end the day by examining how rail keeps America fueled. All in all, we think about 30% of our, of our uh, business is direct energy products. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by CareerTech. A job for every Oklahoman and a workforce for every company. With additional support from the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us here on Horizon. I'm Rob McClinton. We'll look up the word crossroads and you'll find three definitions. A place where roads intersect, a point at which a vital decision must be made, and the main center of activity. And all three certainly apply when you talk about Oklahoma's transportation industry. From trains, planes, automobiles, and barges, our focus today is on the role transportation plays in our economy. And we begin with the big rigs. If trucking stops, Oklahoma stops, America stops. It's that vital. Jim Newport is the executive director of the Oklahoma Trucking Association and says most enterprising industries work on an at-need or just-in-time basis. So if these wheels stop rolling, so does everything else. If you think about fuel at your local gas station, think about the groceries on the shelf, most of those are going to run between a one to a three day supply and they're out. You hopefully in the right lane. Meet Bob right Peterson, president of Melton Truck Lines. Whether it's the bricks behind me or the TVs, it was all moved by truck. And a lot of times trains will move heavy industrial goods to an area, but then a truck takes it and delivers it to its final location. Melton operates more than 1,200 trucks shipping loads from Mexico to Canada with some trucks on the road as long as six months at a time. We think it's important to the state of Oklahoma and to the country simply because it's essential if you want to get goods moved. And while Melton is one of the state's largest private carriers, they're far from alone. Oklahoma is home to over 12,000 trucking companies, the majority smaller mom and pop operations. At Princess Transport in Durant, Danella Miller and her husband Chris use local owner operators to help deliver sand to regional foundries. And just like the national carriers, Princess Transport's entire business model is built on timeliness. If they say we need you there between 6 a.m. and 11 a.m., that's what they mean. If it's not here on time, then we can't produce uh, what our stores are selling, so we can't uh, service our customers. Roger Moore is with the tile shop that produces tile for showrooms across the country. It will halt, if I've ran out, production will halt completely until uh, Princess is able to deliver. And for companies like Melton, that means hitting deadlines all around the nation. We call it just in time. As companies have reduced their inventories, they rely more on trucks to be on time. And so all of our trucks are satellite tracked, so we know where they are at any given point in time. A driver's day is, is a long one and a hard one. It's exceptionally competitive for trucking companies and for hiring of truck drivers. Which is why Melton has an entire staff of recruiters. 
hiring only one of every 200 applicants. My biggest business challenge today is finding safe, reliable truck drivers. And he's not alone. The average age of the truck driver today seems to be moving more towards the late 40s and early 50s. So their longevity, particularly if you add in any kind of health issues, and we hope not, their longevity is somewhat limited. So the recruitment of new drivers, fresh blood, if you will, is a real challenge. So we're looking for drug-free, we're looking for safe driving records, we're looking for dependability. I would definitely say basic math, locating information, reading, comprehension, those are all really important. But in addition to that, they also need good customer service skills because they're in contact with our customers every time they bring a load. Well, and, I, and I refer to them as life skills because there's nothing soft about that. Um, good work ethic, being dependable, being responsible. Uh, good truck drivers need to be patient. You know, if you can imagine driving an 80,000 pound rig in today's traffic, in the snow, uh, uh, you have to be patient. If you're the typical guy that honks a horn every five seconds. You're not gonna like being a truck driver not to mention the hours. And the job is hard. You're gone from home for two to three weeks. Uh, and how do you maintain a marriage and raise children and all that kind of thing? You can make good wages as a truck driver. It comes with some price, and that is time away from home. Uh, so that's kind, of a, that's kind of a rub with family, and everybody knows it. So it's not necessarily an easy life, but it pays well. A life on the road that's not for everyone why some truckers choose to work for short-haul carriers, which takes us back to Princess Transport. What makes that so special to us is that we can provide jobs, truck driving jobs, um, here locally in this area and also come back the same day to where uh, the driver is, is able to come home and uh, on a regular schedule instead of over-the-road truck trucking. Um, which they're out for two or three weeks. Um, our employees are here um, locally, they live here locally, and they, uh, they get to come home every day. And so that, that's, that's, a very, uh, that's a very special thing. They can take a load or two loads a day and be home in the evenings and on the weekends. Family is, is a huge focus for us, and we, we try to work with our, our owner operators so that they can spend that quality time with their family in the evenings and on the weekends, and that's worked out beautifully for us. And earn a living that is more than $10,000 above the state's median income. Um, the wages related to all of the trucking industry, that's gonna be everybody, truck drivers, shops, all, the whole bit, is gonna be north of 3.2 billion, with a B, billion dollars in the state of Oklahoma. That's 2012 statistics. So, in order to keep that economy moving, we're gonna need drivers. Projections are the trucking industry will grow between 20 and 30% over the next 10 to 15 years. Think about that. Think about the trucks that are on the road that you see right now today and add roughly a third more. I'm rounding up, but if we say 30%, let's add a third more in the next 10 years. That means consumer demand is still gonna grow. Hopefully the economy will grow with that to meet that demand, but that's going to be more trucks on the road, more drivers, more jobs. So workforce is just a tremendous issue. Where do those people come from? What could that mean for our, our infrastructure in terms of highways, bridges? To give you a little bit of perspective, trucks and the trucking industry will pay, I'm rounding up, 40% of all road use taxes. It's 39 percent something, so I round it up. They'll pay 40 percent of all fees that are paid for infrastructure, yet they represent about two percent of the registered motoring public. We're paying our fair share. In fact, some trucking companies like Melton would even like to pay more. Actually, our industry has been in favor of raising the diesel tax for years. The United States Secretary of Transportation was here with Senator Rinhoff, and I said, please raise my taxes because the roads in many cases are terrible and so it's two things it is it is causes congestion which adds to pollution which makes my driver's job less desirable and it makes us slower in delivering our goods 
And so we're big behind infrastructure. I'll give kudos and credit to the state of Oklahoma. They actually started a aggressive infrastructure building process well over a decade ago now. And much of the nation has now been trying to follow that. So kudos to Oklahoma. We still have a long way to go, but we're ahead of the curve nationally. So that's a good thing, and that is important, I'll say it again, to the trucking industry and to all of us as consumers. Now it is possible that the funding formula for our roads and bridges could change this legislative session. In recent years, highway dollars for the Department of Transportation have come off the top. But with a billion dollar hole in the state budget, other infrastructure needs like education and health will all be competing for limited funding. Now, if you'd like to learn more about how to coexist with the big rigs on the road, I do have Bob Peterson's best advice on keeping everyone safe streaming on our website. I also have a link to a story I did a couple of years back about how the fuel tax is not keeping up with inflation or technology and how that is taking a toll on all our vehicles. Now, to see either one of those stories, just head over to OKHorizon.com and look for them under our value added section. Now, when we return, we'll meet the people that keep the big rigs rolling. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon with Rob McClendon. Weekly insight into your changing world. Well, never before in recent history has there been such a demand for truck drivers. And a growing number of trucking lines are turning to career tech to fill it. At Central Tech and Drumright, it's classes like this that's become the norm grown adults, learning a new trade, and starting a new career. I was um, contacted by a recruiter that I knew from college. And I said, when do I start? Tim Council completed Central Tech's truck driving training program and says big rigs are a lot different than the standard vehicle. The distance in between vehicles, the tracking and trailing, the braking system, maneuvering, it's all of it's way different than backing up a horse trailer. To operate these big rigs, potential drivers need not only a commercial driver's license or CDL, but training on the equipment they'll be working with. To get started, students learn on over 45 acres of obstacle courses set up for specific encounters they may find out on the road. It's three miles of paved driving that makes this course one of the largest in the country, helping students at Central Tech round the corner to a new future. Now Central Tech has a 98% placement rate, which is certainly good news for their students and the companies that depend upon them. Well, drivers aren't the only thing needed to keep the wheels of commerce rolling. It also takes diesel mechanics. Joining me now is our Courtney May. While diesel technician may not sound like the most glamorous field of work, the annual median pay for a beginner in the field could change your mind. With a certification from a tech center, a diesel technician's median salary is almost $45,000. That's more than the average starting salary of college graduates who receive degrees in math, science, and education. It's an industry where the need for workers is always growing, and having an industry-recognized certification is becoming expected for employees. And Oklahoma Career Tech is helping meet that need. I started out in mechanics as a diesel mechanic about two years ago and I wasn't really at the top of my field so I thought I might come to Cato Kiowa Tech Center and take their diesel mechanics program. And I've got three certifications in, for the state of Oklahoma and now I have four student ASC certifications. Brian Stewart is an adult in the diesel mechanics program at Cato Kiowa Technology Center and he says this program saved his career. I know that with the knowledge I've gained here, anywhere I go, I'll be able to find a job. And I know that I'll be confident in my work whenever I do get a job, that I'll be able to perform as, I, as I'm supposed to. And diesel mechanics instructor James Jackson says, good technicians are in high demand. And this program even allows high school students to take classes while working in the industry. Most truck shops are open 24-7. That enabled them to go to school and work. And uh, they just picked 
the classes that they really needed that would help, that they could add to their resume to help them move up in their job. And one more thing employers look for on a resume is a commercial driver's license, or CDL, and a student can get this training at Caddo Kiowa Technology Center. That CDL, it gives you a, it gives you a step up, uh, another certification that'll, that makes you employable. Uh, there was a gap there that, uh, that, that, that mechanic um, understands the, the vehicle a whole lot more, and like they can also go out and test drive uh, that vehicle to see what's wrong with it. Students are learning in a hands-on environment while applying what they're taught to real industry issues. It's more than just a classroom. I think that's one thing we do here in a career tech. We educate the mind and the hand, not just the mind. So how long does the student need to attend the Technology Center to receive the training? Well, there's different career paths depending on what the student wants to specialize in, but anywhere from 300 to 1,050 credit hours. And if a student takes these courses while still in high school, they can complete this program in two years or less. So they could potentially immediately enter the workforce once they graduate high school. All right, great program. Thank you so much, Courtney. You're welcome, Rob. Still to come on Oklahoma Horizon, moving energy safely around the country. But first, mass transit in Oklahoma. Well, Oklahoma City is known for many things, but a robust public transit system sadly isn't one of them. Mass transit authorities have many different ideas on how to move things forward, but getting the community to move along with them could be a challenge. That's why Oklahoma Watch held a forum to discuss how we move not just goods, but people. Blaine Singletary takes a look at this growing need for the future of Central Oklahoma. I'd like to start off by asking... At this Oklahoma Watch Forum, the big question is, how will you get to the next one? Will many more Oklahomans want to give up their cars and ride the bus or train? And if so... None of these three leaders in Central Oklahoma's mass transit suggested anything that radical happening, but they did say that transit options in the Oklahoma City area are growing and the community is ready for them to do so. So I think a lot of Oklahomans, uh, particularly those in the Oklahoma City metro area, are, are definitely ready to begin using local bus service and utilizing uh, the potential of, of trains in the future. That's Jason Fairbrush, administrator for the Central Oklahoma Parking and Transit Authority. He says you need look no further than the fact that this forum is happening in the first place to see that public transportation is gaining momentum in OKC. And I say that because since implementing some of our uh, enhancements to our local bus system back in 2014, we've seen about a 9.5% increase in passenger trips. And I think we're going to see that same trend when we look at the modern streetcar and in, in a distant future with, with rail as well. In Fairbrush's view, if you build it, they will come. And they have a long wish list. Along with the rail and streetcars, we could see such things as fixed guideways throughout the entire region. But with high projections for population growth in the Sooner State, especially in the central Oklahoma region, that if needs to be a when, as Lauren Branch, former chairman of the OK Alliance for Public Transport, says. The Oklahoma City area is still per capita one of the lowest funded transit systems in the country. We have limited service on weekends, we have, have limited service at night, really um, impacts people's ability to, um, to access the wonderful things that we have here in Oklahoma. And without a more robust public transit system, some business may not even move to Oklahoma in the first place. It's the young professionals who really view that component of a community as a quality of life issue. Doctor issue, medical issues are always a problem, getting to the grocery stores. And transit authorities have plenty of ideas they can't wait to implement. Along with the new forms of transportation around Oklahoma City and nearby communities, an intermodal transit station would link them all together. But in order to do any of that, they need to get these regional communities on board. Danny O'Connor is the director of the Transport Planning Association of Central Oklahoma Governments. This is a regional uh, need. And really, I think, you know, the regional cooperation is just a, a very important step because that's how this advances. City growth doesn't stop at city limits. City streets don't stop at city limits. And so it's very important to find kind of a, a transit solution, a long-term one, 
to help our region grow and continue to thrive and to keep our great quality of life. And a big part of that comes from changing the way Oklahomans think of public transit. Again, Jason Fairbrush. We want to continue to leverage our, our rebranding and just educate the public about the benefits of public transportation and the fact that we believe, although we still have a long way to go, we certainly are a different system, a better system than what we were even five or ten years ago. Their biggest challenge, they say, is convincing people that even if they don't plan on using it, mass transit will benefit them in the long run. Although the fixed guideway or the rail line may not pay for itself, look around that fixed guideway. What kind of economic development has occurred? What has happened to property values? Have areas been revitalized because of the fact that there's now a permanent transit system in place? So I just you know try to remind people that it's, it's really part of the community as a whole and, and as we've heard having a robust transit system adds to that community. With questions on funding, logistics, and infrastructure still on the table, it will be quite some time before Oklahoma City's transit looks like this. But these three can agree, it's on the right track. And, and I gotta tell you, I mean, I really am thrilled to see that, um, that we are taking some steps forward, but we have a long way to go. Well, we checked with Oklahoma City officials and they tell us the modern streetcar transit system should be in place by 2021. And you can check out their proposed routes on their website at okc.gov. Horizon is at your fingertips. Join us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to catch the segments you may have missed and our latest new content as it happens. Well, Oklahoma's energy sector is certainly dependent upon trucking to move the heavy equipment that keeps the industry going. But rail also plays a very important role transporting energy around the nation. Andy Barth was able to sit down with BNSF Steve Ball to talk about the vital role rail plays in our state's transportation equation. Well, BNSF, we really approach the market from four large business segments. Uh, we have our industrial products area, which is the soup to nuts of the industrial economy, everything from cement to chemicals and plastics and forest products. We have coal, which is primarily thermal coal, uh, moving out of Montana and Wyoming, and that's used almost entirely for the production of electricity. We have uh, consumer products, which is really intermodal and automotive, that is uh, moving goods that connect to trucks, and railroads, ocean going, and railroads, and so it's moving intermodally through the network. That's our largest business, really essentially hauling, hauling trucks. And then also agricultural products, which for us is whole grains, fertilizer, and also ethanol. And so you can see energy scattered across uh, three of those four segments. Certainly coal is all about energy. Uh, agriculture has energy components in, in, in ethanol. And then industrial products has, has crude, it has LPGs, but it also has many of the inputs that go into our domestic energy environment, such as frac sand, bentonite clay, and cement. So all in all, we think about 30% of our, of our uh, business is direct energy products. Um, all that said, you hear a lot about crude. Crude is only about 4 to 5% of our volume. Talk to me about the efficiency of moving uh, via railway. Certainly, from a, from a physics perspective. Uh, we do great at moving heavy things long distances. Interestingly enough, just to compare and contrast, if we're talking crude oil, uh, we, we move uh, product faster than pipelines do. So our customers can get, uh, can get pipe things faster than they can through a pipeline. Also, we're really uh, on the rail network, identity preservation. Our customers know what they loaded into each car and they know what they're taking out of that car as opposed to putting it into uh, a, a pipeline or a large vessel or barge where you're getting a lot of commingling of, uh, of products. From an energy consumption perspective, uh, we think we're very efficient in terms of not only the use of fuel, but also the emission of things like uh, CO2. And from its heyday, Oklahoma Rail has lost about half of its original infrastructure. But Union Pacific, Kansas City Southern, and BNSF all have important lines running directly through the Sooner State today. Want to see more stories like this? All our segments are streaming on our YouTube channel at Oklahoma Horizon TV. So what would Kansas do? Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, 
We asked that question to those debating whether recent tax cuts are hurting our economy. We've raised sales tax twice um, this most recent time, and the net impact is that the poorest 40% of Kansans actually saw their, uh, their overall net tax burden go up. Taxes, tax cuts, and our economy on Oklahoma Show for the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, that is going to wrap us up for today, but you can see more of any of our stories on our website at okhorizon.com. You can follow us throughout the week on Twitter at OK Horizon TV, or just become a Horizon fan on Facebook. I'm Rob McClendon. Thanks for including us in your day. Hope to see you back here next week. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry.